We've got to hold on to what we got. It doesn't make a difference if we make it or not. We've got each other, and that's a lot of love for what we got. We'll give it a shot. Oh, we're halfway there. Whoa, living on a prayer. prayer. (laughs) Thank you, Roger. Little Bon Jovi to start the show. I love it. Thank you so much, man. Uh, Welcome to the Construction Life. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been a a show topic that I wanted to do ever since I started this show. Uh, And uh, I don't think, I'm just going to take a stab at it. I don't think other construction podcasts are actually talking about toilets. I don't think so, but it's one of the necessities that every human being has to do. I've I've had a big, huge construction bone to pick with uh, lazy, stupid GCs that refuse to order a toilet, even the bare basic toilet, uh, on their site for their crews, for their sub trays, for everybody. Well, at the end of the day, it's a health and safety concern, especially with people need to go. And it's like, you got to go to the bathroom. If you got to concentrate on going to the bathroom, you're not concentrating on work. No, you're not. So we're going to have an interesting conversation. I want to first do a shout out to uh, Joe. What's up? I'm wearing your tea, man. JR Windows and Doors. I hope all is well. I haven't seen you in a bit. Uh, so hello, Joe. Uh, but we've got Roger Winter on the show here. K Winter Sanitation, Inc. You're the VP. Triple W Winsan. Yep. Winsan uh, dot on dot CA. And it's Winsan GW. Or sorry, Winsan G Winsan Winston at Winston. Oh, okay, there it is. That's an at. That's yeah. what it is. Winston at Winston dot on dot uh, ca. And then you're on Instagram under K Winters Toilets. And then just before we got started, 58 years. Yes, 58 years my parents have been running it. And I've been wow. involved for 48 years. I'm 48 years old. <laughs> so, I mean... All right, we'll try to get as many puns in this show as we possibly can. Yeah. Uh, I do have a lot of respect for you guys because I've always uh, upgraded the toilet. I've never gone to bare bones. And I know that when we spoke on the phone, you reminded me of certain laws that came in uh, regarding heat, electricity, and even AC and everything like that, like proper facilities yes. that were implemented when? This was the 90s. 1991. So I thought it was actually not too long ago, like five or six years ago, that it was implemented that way because I, I, I tell you, and you probably have seen it, most construction sites do not even offer that. They don't even get a toilet that has that and during the winter months. Yeah, like technically 1991, and then they revisited it back in 2000. And basically each toilet's supposed to have if electricity is on site, heater, warm water, lights, and a heater. And but, they, it, but they don't. They don't. It's And it's sad because... It's so easy to, to, to supply. 15 amps can supply the heat of warm water and the heat, and these units are available. I mean, I don't know why the construction companies haven't done it. Like, They just, uh, um, I, they're not good individuals. That's all I'm going to say. Because uh, I've heard the horror stories. You had lots of trades that have been on the show or even guys that I've spoken to on, on, on the job site, on my job site, talking about other job sites and talking about how they're glad when it's the finishing stage because you get all these empty boxes so then you can use the bathroom with these empty boxes and that's not right Uh, i think there should be a lot more respect when it comes to the tradespeople. they're the ones that have been there since day one building the structure most gcs a lot of these guys are the cafe gcs they don't even show up on site they're having those loud conversations in their trucks or whatever on the street they don't even care about what's going on inside as long as the work is being done when it's supposed to be done but like you said off mic people need to go to the bathroom every single person on the construction they need to go to the bathroom and it's but with COVID the last couple of years the the interest and the and the respect that a lot of more has came into the sanitation and the portal yeah. toilets and the sinks like yeah. it's basically been a big wake up call to a lot of general contractors a lot of supers a lot of everybody on site that hey we have to wash our hands hey we have to have clean washrooms if not this site's going to be shut down because everybody's now infected yeah so I want to ask you why did your dad get into this business I mean sixty years ago he used to dig wells. He used to be a well digger, so he used to actually dig wells by hand. He went up to 55 feet into the ground. Wow. And then he started getting into water pumps, and then he started doing septic tank pumping, and then he started and basically said, okay, let's try portable toilets. So he started building wooden portable toilets and just kept building and building and building, and then got out of the septic tank business and just stayed in the portable toilet business. All right, so I really want you to walk us through the whole procedure, all the different models that you have what we should technically have on the site. I know that you've already mentioned it briefly, but I mean, you, I'm sure you've been to sites and we've all been to job sites. The bare bones ones is one that we all were so used to. And now that we're going into the winter months, 
I've been through that experience, man. I, I've, I've been through it where it's like, you have to have this heat. This is ridiculous, right? I've never been called out from a ministry of labor coming by on the site. Right. Um, but I mean, like, just have a little bit more respect. So can you just enlighten us on all the different models that you have? Okay, I'll start off with our basic unit. Our basic unit that we rent has a cold water sink in it that works year round. And we also have a flush toilet, like a hand flush with a hand sanitizer or soap. And then we also have uh, with the service card, Yertle. That's our basic unit. Now our second unit that we have, the upgrade from that, if you have electricity on site, has an infrared heater light that actually heats the person and heats the toilet seat. Very efficient. Heats the toilet seat. Yeah, it heats the toilet seat. So it's like an infrared light. It works beautiful. Does it glow red? Like It glows red. It's like actually a white one, but it, it makes the heat nice because like being in the sunlight. Infrared heat is very efficient. That's kind of cool. Um, and then we also have the heat of warm water in there. It's all electrical safety authority approved. We have, that's our next step up. Then after that, we have wheelchair accessible toilets that are that for sites that have people with wheelchairs or people that are want a little bit bigger units. We have stuff with cold waters, warm waters. Then we have the BFT, the big effing unit, but, <laughs> but it, it meets all the building code responsibilities for uh, the five foot turnaround for a wheelchair. If there's any of that sites, we have those type of units too. Okay. Then we also have our Supreme unit, which is um, we make out a half inch plastic um, marine starboard and it's got a water flush uh, toilet seat on it. It's got heated warm water. It's a bigger unit. It's got electrical fan heater on the side, a light on it. Works very efficient. We build them ourselves. We've actually designed it and, and use it. All the units or are you guys? No, these are the ones that we build ourselves. Okay. All right. Um, then the next step up, we also have unit. Then we have a double Supreme. Now we put two together and we build them together and they're on a skid. So the nice part is there's no steps to fall up or nothing to rock. Like there's no rocking like it's in a trailer. There's It's not super cold because it's not that high up. And they're very efficient for just getting two 15 amp fuses, uh, two 15 amp cords to plug in and everything's good. Then we have units that go on high rises that go up on cranes that can either go up 400 feet in the air or 400 feet down into a hole that also have either cold water sinks or heated warm water sinks and infrared heaters. Then we also have our rollout units, we call them wheelies, that go onto condos that have heat, electri- um, collapsible roof on them. They're on wheels. They have heat, um, heated warm water, lights, a urinal inside, and they're amazing. They go into units, they're like... They have the condo industry, love them. Because otherwise they have heat, they just plug them in wherever they are in the floors. They can wash their hands with heat of warm water. They have lights and they have everything. Where What's l- normally the rule with condos? Is it every three, third floor? Every or? every third floor. Every third floor. So that's the minimum. Yes. But I, would, I do want to ask you, okay, so how a, an average toilet, how many people can it accommodate on a weekly basis? Because you're cleaning them every week, Are right? you talking how many people can fit inside them at one time? No, 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 <laughs> no use them. <laughs> okay, no, just... Because no, we no. used to have a sticker. That it's said, not that kind of show, Roger. We used to have ten to fifteen people, and then we had used to say people would put that sticker. Well, we only got seven people in here. No, 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 no. Because I know that there's a okay, limit yeah, on it's, it's, depending know. on the size of the crew and yeah. basically how many times yeah. you actually use it. Right? Yeah, it's one to ten people per per week. Per week, right? So if you have a crew that's larger than that, sometimes yeah. you get to that stage where you're doing custom rentals and you've got probably about fifteen or twenty people they need all that coming second, in. They need so a second toilet, a second cleaning, or or will you get a second cleaning or you get a second toilet? Yeah, it all depends on how big the site is. Sometimes Sometimes you've only got a small site. Sometimes you can get additional ser- weekly service. Um, and sometimes people are just, not to sound bad, they're just pigs. Yeah. So Oh, no, no, we know. We so, know. So the some supers basically sit there and say, I want that unit clean. Because the Ministry of Labor regulations are that toilet has to be clean every time a worker goes to use it. Every time? Yeah, it should be clean. It should be sanitary that it should be clean. Now, it doesn't have to be. Doesn't have to be a service driver come out, but that unit should be presentable that a, a worker should be able to use it. Okay, so basically, you just got to keep an eye out for the pigs. Yes, because for I, whatever reason, there's some tradespeople out there that just treat it like crap. Yeah, like no we, pun intended, but well, they do. Some, some of our drivers, they've been on sites where, let's say, we have six or seven units, and all of a sudden, the super calls and says, "Hey, we got a problem with that toilet." We go back, and the guy goes, "I just serviced it five minutes ago." They go on the cameras. They go, "That guy did it," and that guy's the one that walked in. They call him up. Boom, he's off site. So he purposely did it. He purposely did a mess, made a disaster to toilet. Wow. So these guys, are, these people, I should say, no guys or girls, but trades people, yeah. trades person is getting off the site because they make it bad for everybody. I mean, yeah. you got to use that toilet. I mean, it's like your house. If that's for 12 hours a day. That's your washroom. So is it the same for the other larger units, the, the BFL, whatever that you were talking about? Yeah, uh, the, let's the say like the w- freshwater flush, they're good for one to 15 people. 
per okay, week. Okay, all right. So the larger the unit, the more people you can use it for a week basis, yeah. right? If it has fresh water flushed and it's, it's like a trailer unit, it could be 15 people per trailer. Okay, so Roger, like, like, talk to me about number-wise, right? So here we are in Toronto, Canada. So obviously let the Americans do their exchange rate and let the, everybody else that's listening yeah. around the world do the exchange rate. But I mean, we're not talking a shitload of work, you know, money here. We're not talking about that, right? No, like with weekly service, let's say our basic cold water sink is, let's say, 285 per week, yeah. or per, per month, I meant to say. Yeah. And we service it, we drop it off, we do everything. And let's say our warm water is $100 more, so it's 385 and our Supreme's $500 per month. Which is not crazy. And our double, serv- our double Supreme's $900 a month with weekly service. But the double is servicing how many, 1 to 15? It's servicing 1 to 15. It's servicing, actually, our double does 30 people. Oh, wow. And it's it's nine hundred dollars per month. Wow! And then I mean, you you're not also servicing the construction industry. You're also servicing other industries as well too. We service because with COVID, we went into a lot of factories because a lot of the truck drivers couldn't go into the actual manufacturing plants. But these truck drivers were the heart and soul of our country, moving everything, yep. keeping everybody in business. And they went to the half driving three or four hours, getting to the place, and going, "Oh yeah, you can't use their bathroom." And the poor person's got to unload the truck for two hours or an hour yeah. because they're doing Well, what do you do? So a lot of these people got toilets for them, and we still have them out at a lot of manufacturing facilities, a lot of different um, warehouses and everything like that. It was a good pickup for us. So was it a good thing that the pandemic happened, that it kind of woke up everybody that we have to have better maintain, better cleaning? Everyone should be a part of this whole process to keep it clean and organized. Was it really? Did that, did that it, happen? It helped us. Like, right, we thought when COVID hit, we thought we were done. Like we thought that the premier was going to shut down the whole construction industry, that we were going to be shut down. We didn't know what we were going to do. We thought we were done. Then all of a sudden everything started going crazy and we just, our phones just lit up and we couldn't keep up. It just got so busy. It's a good thing. It's a good thing, but it's hard though, because you can only expand so fast. It's, you only get so many good people. You can only get so many good trucks. You can only build so fast because there are supply chain issues, major supply chain issues, trying to get sinks, trying to get um, stuff to build, trying to get deodorants, trying to get hand sanitizers, trying to get paper towels, trying to get... Wow, to- there must and have been a shortage of all every- that stuff. But we're lucky we're a large company that we buy 200 cases of toilet paper at a time. We bring 200 cases of paper towels in at a time. So when we sit there and say, hey, we want 400 cases brought in, the, the company doesn't even blink. Where a lot of our competitors weren't bringing in that much... So they got, they were shortened. So they were only maybe allowed to bring in 100 a month where we were allowed to bring whatever we want. So it's interesting that when I first got started in construction, I ordered the basic one. Yeah. And then it wasn't until I started building a home and then I'm going through the whole seasons. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I started realizing, hang on a sec, I need to upgrade this. And I wasn't upgrading it uh, thinking, I was thinking about the whole crew, but I was thinking about myself because I was on site. I was using it. Right. And I'm like, this is not comfortable for myself. So then I want to upgrade it. So I'm going to make it. So then I started getting closer and closer to the legal requirements of having a proper toilet on site. Right. Around the same time that I was being told by other people that, you know, this job site doesn't even have a toilet. This job site doesn't even have a toilet. They don't even do this. And I keep going back to that basic human just function that we need this stuff. But I get a lot of trace people that even though it's clean and it is maintained and we have a respectful crew on the site, they still refuse to use it. They rather go down to the local coffee shop and use theirs. And my mindset is like, you really think that's cleaner than what was just clean right now? Well, the whole thing is at the end of the day, it's all about time on site, like how much lost time. So if you send a person, a crew down to a Tim Hortons or down to the thing, you lose close to an hour. Or the tradesperson actually doing it on their own so they can have a nice little break. Yeah, but then the problem is, is that is a, I looked at a report, how much actual time is actually like for a carpenter is actually building something like he's got to find his tools. He's yeah. got to find the lumber. He's got to find everything. He's got to put everything together. He's got to talk to the super what's going to be built. Yep. So actually time on a hammer, actually building stuff isn't a lot of time on the actual day. So if that person loses an extra hour on at a toilet going back and forth or what happens if the crane operator sits there and says, okay, you know what? I got to go to the bathroom for an hour. That whole crew on the ground sometimes is shut down. <laughs> And, or if that crew guy, or if that crane guy is that person sitting up there and he's got to wait and he's sitting there concentrating on not having to go to the bathroom, what happens if he's off by one inch? Yeah. Somebody loses a hand. Yeah. He's off by two feet. Somebody loses, somebody gets squished. Yeah. And he's just concentrating on not going to the bathroom because he's trying to, or the person's not going to go to the bathroom, but they're not concentrating. It's like if you're sitting in, um, just had 
bad food and you're on the highway and the highway's plugged and you're sitting there going, okay, I got to get, I got to get off to a bathroom. Yeah. You're not concentrating on driving. You're nope. concentrating on basically focusing on whatever you can not to focusing on the prairie dog. That's what yeah, you're focusing what you, on. You don't want anything to <laughs> pop out. So, yeah. so that's what we're trying to say is you got to be, that's where we want to make sure everybody's safe and has clean bathrooms. That's why we do double service. Sometimes we have, we've had sites where, we were on Union Station where it was everyday service. Every day to tell yeah, us that I've had a few times where I had to do a double service per week just because there was so many. It wasn't like we were passing the number of crew that was accommodating that toilet. I just, they were having big meals, I guess. I don't know what was going on, but it was just getting full faster. Well, the thing is, you look at it, what the average construction worker is paid and the actual, how much, or like the labor is paid, and you figure how much money it is per, per month for the toilet. It's nothing, but if you can keep the good crews, keep everybody happy, you save an hour a day on people. You it, you make that money up for toilets and no nothing. I mean, they think it's a big expense, but at the end it's of the not, day, it's not. you're talking a million dollars sometimes in a month in salary for some of these big jobs, and you're talking like maybe a couple thousand dollars for toilets to keep these guys keep everybody happy on site. It's nothing. It was really a sign of the times when I I was doing it the way you're supposed to do it. And then all of a sudden you had tradespeople starting on the job site and they would go and visit and then come back out. And they were like, man, there's heat in there. And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, we've never had heat in there. I don't get it. And so, so many people did that. So it just, it started making me wake up about how the industry was really abusing this particular line item on the job site. And the thing is, it makes people comfortable. You go to the bathroom, it's nice, it's warm. You feel you feel like a human being. Otherwise, you go in there and it's like this morning. If you went in there, no heat. It's extremely cold. And then you got to do your business, and then you got to take off your jacket and take off everything. It it takes time, and you're sitting there. It's it's not fun. Where if it's got a little bit, of, it's got heat in there. It's a little bit more comfortable. I want to ask you about the employees because every person that I've ever met that you know, and and you you've seen the twelve questions, so everyone's familiar familiar yeah. with the twelve, 12 questions. And uh, there was a question there about a job you would not do, and your job is the one job that comes up quite a bit. That people say I wouldn't want to do that. I don't want to do the the cleaning of the toilets and anything like that. And and that's it's just natural, right? Yeah. Um, but I mean, everybody that I have that does that job, they're down to earth, great people. And I'm just assuming, do you have a lot of turnover, or do you have a lot of great you know people that work for you that do that? Well, most of my service drivers have been with us from the start of the pandemic, and they've, they've done really good. It's just hard trying to add more people, like more great people. Like our service drivers we have, our delivery drivers are great people, but trying to add those extras, that's the problem. It's trying to, add, trying to find more good people. They just don't want to do it. Well, it's not that I don't think everybody I talk to, nobody wants to work. Like I've got friends in car industry. I've got friends in the... Uh, every industry, like restaurants, everything. Nobody wants to work anymore. Nobody wants to actually do anything. That's the sad part. That's a different whole. Yeah, I know, but I'm just yeah. saying. It, but it's it's sad though because nobody wants to get dirty. Nobody wants to, like everybody's short staff right now. It's not. It, but they're not short staff for the reason that there's there isn't people to fill that stuff. It's just people don't want to do any kind of work. People don't want to work, and that's the sad part because we got don't like. I mean, I look at the. They're talking about the food banks right now. It's sitting there saying we've got to give to the food banks, which sounds great. But right now, anybody who's able-bodied could get a job. Yeah. And that's, that's what I said to my staff today. I go, what happens next year if we're in a bad recession and we've only got a third of the jobs or half the jobs? Then our food banks are going to be crucified. Yeah. And that's the sad part. I mean, we got anybody who wants to work can work right now. I mean, but we also got to help the people that can't work. Yep. The people that can't work or people that are disabled or people that got hurt, we need to help those people because they are getting, they got nothing. Yeah. They, we have to help those people. I agree. Totally. Um, I want you to walk us through, nobody ever thinks about where this stuff goes. I know that you guys come in, you guys have your vac. Yep. Um, everybody kind of finds a, a place upwind. Uh, so then we won't kind of experience it, uh, yeah. cause it's kind of, it's pretty nasty. Just everyone knows this. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, you guys come in, you guys suck it all out. You pressure wash it, you clean all that stuff. Yeah. Um, what else do you guys do that? You, you refill everything. We refill everything. We sanitize the unit. We get everything cleaned up. We sign the service card. Then we make sure everything's working and then we mark it on our route sheets and then we head on to the next site. We've had some guys on the show talk about, and there's one in particular, Carlos. So I'm going to give him a shout out to uh, Caveman uh, Construction, Caveman Landscapes. And he dropped his iPhone, his brand new iPhone in there, <laughs> and he didn't go back in to go get it. So I can only assume that you guys are probably 
Well, we get iPhones every once in a while. <laughs> what we tell what we tell people is if they do that, they phone us up. I said, grab a garbage bag, put your hand in, go get your phone. I'm not saying it's the best, but person's got fourteen hundred dollar phone, got all their SIM cards in there, got everything. It's like just put a garbage bag on, put your hand in there, and get it. I'm not saying it's the best, but it's easier said than done. Yeah. Uh, and when he brought it up, I mean, we all ask ourselves and. Would you put your hand in there? Would you put your? I get it. It's a garbage bag. I get it. But yeah, you're right. It's a it, nowadays. It's a two thousand dollar phone with your yeah. SIM and everything like that. Yeah. Yeah, and you got to like sometimes you might not get the SIM card back because now the SIM card's done and there's all your photos gone. So. <sighs> well, we had some fun with it. We started calling it "I shit," <laughs> you know. So it was just, <laughs> uh, but it was like, yeah. So you're on you're on the toilet. You're you're using your phone, and sure enough, something could slip or whatever, and then you're dropping it. Then you drop it, and, and it's gone. All right, so now you guys suck all that waste out, and then you guys pressure wash it, clean it all up, yeah. get it nice and tidy. Where does all that stuff go? Why? I'm you just, want some? No, I don't want any of it. Are you I'm, sure? I'm trying to follow the path. I want to let people know where this... <laughs> okay, we they, see you guys show up on site. You guys yeah. take care of our, our, our bathroom so then we can continue using it, continue working, yeah. uh, being productive, and then you know you guys go, and nobody really thinks about it. And it goes to sewage plants. Okay. All portable toilet waste in Ontario goes to sewage plants. All right. Yeah. And that's it? That's it. The sewage plant deals with it and takes care of it, and they treat it with the... Because right now, it's all portable toilet waste is all fresh. Where some stuff coming in from septic tanks has been sitting in the septic tanks two to three years, so it's a little bit stale. Where sewers are meant, sewers are like basically portable toilets. It's basically really super fresh. Like everything in our tanks, we deodorize. They're all environmentally friendly. They're not like we don't use any harsh chemicals or anything like that. What is the blue stuff? It's blue stuff. What do you think it is? I don't know what it is. What is it? <laughs> it's like a special stuff. It's like enzymes that basically breaks down everything in the toilet. Okay. All right. It makes it deodorant and basically environmentally friendly because otherwise before a lot of companies were using like hard formaldehyde, which basically killed people's noses, cancer causing. Wasn't it, good for the environment. Wasn't good for anybody because as soon as it hit the uh, sewage plants, it automatically killed all the bugs. Like great for, great, great for deodorant. Great for everything, but it killed everything. That's what they embalm bodies with oh, formaldehyde. Wow! So I don't. So that's we we stopped using that about <laughs> twenty five years ago. Was my dad. Dad lost a couple of friends in the industry because of that because they're using formaldehyde, cat cancer. So my dad said, "Dope." We're Constant septic. use over and over. Constant use of that formaldehyde is just bad for you. Let me do a little history and construction here. This is going to be interesting. Uh, we're talking about municipal wa wastewater systems in Canada. Over 5,900 mu uh, million, sorry, 5,900 million, yeah, 5,900 million cubic meters of sewage pass through our municipal water systems, water uh, wastewater systems in 2017. 97% of wastewater is treated before it is discharged. Most wastewater, 48% of it, gets secondary treatment, removing biodegradable organic matter and solids. Just over 30 million Canadians are served by municipal water wastewater systems. 50% of them are served by secondary treatment systems. 3% of the wastewater is untreated due to no treatment systems or sewer overflows from intense rainfall. British Columbia has the most untreated wastewater as of 2017 at 29%, followed by Quebec at 23 and Ontario here we're at 8%. Uh, wastewater volumes generally peak in April. Why April? Oh, the rain. That's the why. Rain. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. All right, so you're taking the blue stuff, it goes over there, and then it just dissipates, I guess, into... Um, yeah, like it all feeds into the system, but the system, like, we're only putting in a, a limited amount, so how much is coming in from the city, it all just blends in and nobody knows it. I'm just having these visualizations, that's all. Okay, all right, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, like it's not, like we take our trucks, take our truck, goes there, everything gets dumped, no problems. So it gets dumped from the tank on the belly, or... The tank of the truck, like we have three, three compartment tanks, like we have one with fresh water... Um, like we one for our filling our sinks, one for our filling our tanks, and then we have a sewage or septic tank at the back, like a wastewater tank. Okay. And then that's where it dumps out of. How many, uh, right now, how many toilets do you have? Two. No, well, no, no, sorry. How many actual? Two, but we service them real well. We have 23 trucks. No, 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 toilets. Two, but we service them real well. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> we have thousands of them out there. Yeah, you have thousands of them? Yeah. And then you, are you constantly making new ones? And We're always building. We're always building new ones. You We're can't keep up with the demand? Can't keep up with the demand. We're always building. We like to build. Like that's one of the things we like construction. So we're building our units and we're always trying to keep up. 
The market just keeps going. So. Hasn't really changed all that much, eh, Roger, since your dad started the business? I mean, the porta potty itself, the toilet They're Basically itself. the same size. Then about 10 years ago, we're down at the conference, me and my dad were, and we said, we got to change the industry. We got to make something nicer because right now everything's the same size. It's too small. Like if you look at that there's, toilet, it's on our left. There's a, sorry, there's a toilet trade show, like a yeah, conference? Yeah, it's like PSAI. It's called Portal Sanitation International. Wow. So it's big. Where is it at? Where, where is uh, it? The next one, I think, is in Tennessee. This coming up in end of, end of January. Okay. That'd be an interesting show to go to. Yeah, it's a good show. <laughs> but we looked at the same. Everything's, everybody was exact same size of toilet. So we looked at it and said, well, wait, wait a second. We've got to change the market. So what we did is we made a bigger unit out of marine-grade starboard. So it's half-inch thick um, uh, plastic. And then we made it bigger, and then we made it with a foot flush, and then we made it with um, everything's everything's operated by foot. So if you don't need power to run it, but then we've also got a heater in it, so it's a little bit bigger footprint. So let's say four inches by four inches, which makes a lot of difference in size when you're inside that unit. Yeah. It's called the Supreme Unit. Yeah. And that just took off. Like once we started building that, can we get eight? Can we get seven? We want that. We want a Supreme Unit. And that's where I'm not saying that the small unit is going to be out, but people want bigger units. They want a coat hook. They want to be able to – a little bit more comfort. They want. They want to have. They want to be human beings. Yeah, it's really simple. Yeah, it's not. And I mean, it's a little bit more money. But at the end of the day, housing prices have just about doubled. Everything's going up, and people need comfort. I mean, as a guy, as a person says, any construction worker can go to any different job they want to right now, as long as they're good. Any good person can get a job anywhere. It's interesting you're saying that. I mean, yeah, we all know this. Housing prices have doubled, but not our labor rates. No. Our, all of our materials have not all doubled. Uh, you guys haven't doubled your charges for using your facilities. No. Um, but all, all the end user, the end product, it's dramatically doubled, right? Yeah, look, we did raise our rates during before the COVID. We, we had a set rate, and we stayed with it all the way through COVID. Where do you think, like, I mean, since your dad started 60 years ago, where do you think, is it going to still evolve? Are you going to keep on improving these toilets? And then what are we going to see? What are they going to look like 20 years from now? Well, some people, 25 years ago when I was in university, people said, well, portable toilets, that's a dying industry. Because, I wouldn't think that. No. But they thought everything's going to be hooked up to sewers. Everything's going to be hooked up to trailers. But the problem is trailers are good for these big sites where they can hook up to sewers, hook up to water, big things. We're never going to compete with that. That's... That's done. Everything's happy with that. But housing, construction, manufacturing, all these places, portable toilets are still going to be used. I was going to – sorry? But the thing is, though, is that customers are getting more picky. They want service. They want quality. They want they want stuff delivered. They're soon going to be – when's my when's that toilet going to be there? But we can check out our GPS. So we know the truck's going to be there in 10, 15 minutes. We call ahead for these big sites to bring the site toilets down. Or bring them up, or off, let's say the rollouts or wheelies, they'll bring them down. They'll have them down there for, let's say, 7 in the morning. A driver goes up there. They're all sitting on the rack waiting for us, and they take them back up. Everybody's happy. I want to talk about your competition because I've always disagreed about your competition. And when I say your competition, I'm talking about the tradespeople or the GZ think that it's a clever idea to put a temporary toilet in the basement of a job site uh, inside the house. And, and my first thought is, who's going to maintain this? Because it ain't going to be the GC, I'll tell you that right now. And if any of you guys want to make a mess, miss the bowl, or do whatever, I'm not cleaning this stuff. So as soon as it gets dirty, nobody's going to use it, and there goes your competition. And then the biggest problem is, is that they run out of toilet paper. So the tradespeople go, oh, look, there's some brick, there's some brick paper, there's some stuff from, uh, from the bags of bricks. So now they start flushing that down the toilet. Yeah. And then before you know it, now the thing's plugged. Now they got to get somebody in there to take it out, and everything's plugged right to the road, to the sewers. And sometimes you're in the thousands of dollars. You got the plumber on site. and you Or now you've got an overflow in the basement. Or the person's just laid down beautiful uh, ceramics all down, like on the floors and, yeah. and everything. And now these guys are coming across with their construction boots, just scratching the floors. And, or the person goes, at the end of the day, goes, hey, your house was a toilet house. The person's like, what do you mean? They go, doesn't your toilet flush right? The person's like, no, I've never, I always wondered about that. Oh. Because the toilet's basically been they wrecked it because they keep flushing all this stuff, all this bad stuff down, and just to save a few hundred dollars every month. Just to save a few hundred dollars, like I mean, yes, you can do that if you had a few people just doing uh, like a little bit of work on the site. Yeah, no problem. But when you start having fifteen, twenty, thirty people, you start putting these toilets, and it's not really saving anybody any money. I get into some gripes with neighbors at times because they never want the toilet parked at the front. 
And I'm like, okay, fine. I'll try to be Mr. Happy and, and I'll push it to the back. But then there's a limit on how far away it can be from the actual curb because you guys need to access it, right? Yeah, we need to be within about 25 feet from the road with yeah. the hoses. Yeah. Like we have a little bit more, but as I say, we want to make it sure that like when our truck's pulling off to the side of the road, we want to make sure the driver's safe. We want to make sure the person, like when he walks around to put it to, to service it, he doesn't want to pull 40 feet of hose because he doesn't want to wreck a car. He doesn't want to wreck a, a, a beautiful fence or whatever. So I'm just saying, so he's got to make sure he can get to it safe. you got to be conscious of everybody, right? Now the neighbors, sometimes we've had neighbors that never complain. And then there's neighbors that will complain at anything. Like they'll just squawk and you're sitting there going, the person's doing the best they can. Yeah. And it's like, do you want the person pissing on your front lawn? No. Well, and they're doing road work. And sometimes we get the road work. We do a lot of sewer and water. And they're like, going, we got a toilet in front of our house. And it's kind of like, that's the least of your worries. You're going down 100 feet in front of your house. So I think the toilet's going to be the least of your worries. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> but some people complain about everything. I mean, and, and unless you want to open up your house and let the workers come into your house to use the bathroom, nobody wants to do that. But, but they also feel sorry for some of these people that have been on the streets for, let's say, 50 years, and they have a nice lot, and they have a nice thing, and now the neighbor's sold, and now they're putting up a 5,000, 6,000 square foot house right beside them. I do feel sorry for them. I'm not saying I don't, yeah. but but that's that's life. I mean, it, it happens. Um, I was gonna. Do you encourage the guys to lock them, the yes. units? Yes. Um, on for the weekends, right? Or well, just in general. Well, the thing is, is that when you're downtown Toronto or downtown on somebody's sewer and water mains, like we've had my drivers go, "What are we supposed to do?" And I'm like, "What do you mean? What are we supposed to do?" There's a person inside the toilet. And I'm like. I can't do anything. Just tell the super that somebody's inside that toilet. Yeah. It's a homeless person and it's got heat and it's got everything. And you don't, I mean, I'm not going to, I don't put my drivers into a situation where they're, they don't know what that person's on or what that person's got a problem. Yeah. Yep. So I just tell them, don't call the police, just tell the super and let the super deal with it. I've done that before where, I mean, I, you lock it up because of those same reasons, right? But I do keep it during the course of the day because you never know. I, I've had people that are doing garbage for the week or whatever, and I've had guys just race to it and, can I use it? And I'm like, of course you can use it. Go ahead and yeah. use it, right? We're all on site. We're all working. And sure, you're another person. You're working. You need a toilet. You don't know where you're going to go to next. Yeah. So it's the same thing. And if everyone's like, if there is a homeless person and it's during the day we're there, I'm fine with it. But when it's the evenings and the weekends yeah that could happen someone could basically move in now yeah and then it's like we've had one we had one downtown to Barry. we couldn't figure out every monday morning that the unit was full but it was on the on the raid of the bar so everybody's walking past it as they left the bar and when they were going to the bar so monday mornings that unit was full and the guy's like nobody's worked out the weekend <laughs> but our three units are overflowing and we're like they can't be overflowing and we're like there's gotta be something wrong and then all of a sudden we put it together that People are coming from the college parts of town and walking past it, using the bathroom, making it full. And then before, as they're coming home, they're using it again. And Monday morning, the super's like, toilet's full. We're like, did you guys work this weekend? No. So you never know. Every opportunity, you never know. Everything's, everything's an opportunity. I want to ask you, because you provide toilets for so many other different industries and, I guess, parks and functions and whatever, all kinds of stuff. Are we still the messiest con contractors, tradespeople? No, right? I'm, I, it's good to hear that. I mean... No, the majority of construction people have cleaned up themselves. Like, they're a lot better. Like, the bricklayers used to be the worst. They used to always <laughs> hear that the bricklayers are the worst. But now you don't hear that because now it's like the, everybody's getting better. Everybody's getting more. They realize that everybody has to... Somebody has to use it behind them. And then especially with this COVID where six feet apart, wash your hands, keep everybody clean, keep everybody... It makes everybody think about it. Like, hey, I don't want to be in there somebody's Joe's in there coughing and spitting and doing everything like that. Yeah, so yeah. now everybody's kind of a little bit more conscious. What's the rule with ministry of labor and smoking in the units? You're not allowed, right? Technically. Yeah. You're not supposed to be smoking on inside a unit. Yeah. Cause I know that a lot of trades, especially in the winter months, they'll be in there doing their business and having a smoke. And then they're in there for a while. And then you go in there and it's, it's got this funny order about smoke and poo. You know what I mean? Well, I remember one time I was servicing toilets for an amusement company and I walked in and I told it was hot boxed. <laughs> Really? Yeah, I walked in. I was like, I was probably like 17. I was like, wow. <laughs> Started seeing colors. <laughs> oh, I'm not advising people to do that. I'm just no. saying it was kind of like, I walked in. I was like, whoa. <laughs> 
Because that's what they'll do. They'll use it as that kind of space. That's what I'm trying to get at. So, yes. I mean, it, it goes back to respecting the rest of the trade, all the trades there that are on the site. They're got to use it too. Maybe they might not be doing what you're doing, but they got to still use it, right? Yes, everybody's got to be safe on the site. Yeah, that's what it is. Let me share a little bit of OBC talk here. Uh, OBC definitions. We've been doing a lot of def definitions lately. Back siphonage, uh, backflow caused by negative pressure in the supply system. A back vent, it's a pipe installed to a vent or trap off the horizontal section of an integral, integral uh, siph siphonic flushing system. Uh, barrier free, a uh, building and its facilities that can be approached, entered, and used by people with disabilities. Barrier, bearing surface, uh, the contact surface between foundation and soil or rock. Bottle trap, a trap that retains water in a closed chamber sealed by submerging the inlet pipe in the liquid or by a partition submerged in the liquid. Breaching, uh, a flue pipe for receiving flue gases from one or more connections and for discharging them through a single connection. Building control valve, the valve on a water system controlling the flow of potable water to the water distribution system. Building drain, uh, the lowest horizontal piping that conducts sewage, uh, clear water, waste, or stone water to a building sewer. And the last one, a building trap, a trap installed in a sanitary building drain sewer to stop air circulation between the system and the public sewer. Um, what other little stories can you share, Roger? Uh, I mean, you've got a few decades of... I'm I remember I got a phone call from 680 News one day, and they said they had the best view of the city, and they had the worst view of the city. So the worst view of the city was pumping portable toilets. So the guy said, he goes, can you come down to Toronto? And let's say in a, on a Friday afternoon, he goes, we're going to go up to CN Tower, and you're going to walk around, and you're going to look at the best view. So it is easiest because portable toilets are the worst view. So we're walking down. He goes, well, he says, what do you see? I said, I see competition. He goes, what do you mean by competition? I go, I see all those trees. They're my competition. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had the glass, and he goes looking down. He goes, what do you think of that? I go, I've never seen something that deep in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so it was quite a thing. It was quite a thing. It was on, a, it was like, uh, on 680 News. So it was a great thing to do. So I try to do all these different things. You really don't have to sell yourself. I mean, everyone calls you guys because they need you guys, for yeah. the most part, the ones that want to be responsible builders. Yeah, we, we do. Like It's always about price, but as we look at it, do you want price or do you want service? But everybody's within a certain everybody's, 10, 15 points at the most. Everybody's tight. I mean, as we look at it, we, 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 we put our family name on it. We answer our calls. We we try to get everything done as much as possible. I mean, it's hard sometimes with with, with workers right now, but, I mean, as a, we try to do the best, and if we can't get it, we, we tell people. We try to do our best. It's all we can do. I mean, with supply issues... Everybody's got problems right now. Everything back to normal now after the last two, three years? <sighs> We'd say that, but it's hard to get labor. It's hard to get people to work. So that's the one big thing right now. And one big thing is trying to get workers and trying to get trucks. We just brought in, we ordered two, three trucks last August in 2021. Still waiting? We just got two of them in in September, the end of September, and one's coming in. It's still not in. It's supposed to be in this week or something. Where are they coming from, states? Yeah, they're F-550s and F-600s. Okay. But they're not, like, now we're supposed to get a tank built, but the guy that's building our tank, he's been delayed because his crane went down because, and he's waiting for parts. So it's all, everybody's it's waiting. It's a trickle. Everything waits. And then he phoned me up, and he's like, do you have your truck? And I'm like, why? Because we ordered it last, we ordered this last year, like a year ago, for this truck to be built. And he thought we'd be building it up in the summer, which I thought so too, but we didn't have the truck, so we can't build it before without the truck. Wow. And it just, it slows down the whole process. So you ever get crane ops when you're doing the toilets up in the high-rise construction sites? They think it's a, a metrodome, and they just want to keep on swinging it back and forth and have all that blue liquid floating around. I know I, know I was about probably about 20 <laughs> years old, and I was on a site, a big condo site. There's three towers, and I went to the first, I went to the super, and I said, I thought I was talking to the super. I said, can you bring the units down? The guy goes, no problem, I'll bring the units down. So I went around, and there was only about two or three Drop one of the units, but I knew there was like 10 units. They had to drop down, and they hadn't dropped down. So I go back to the site super, and I go, they only brought down one unit for me. And there's like about well, five supers standing in front of the trailer, and the guy goes, well, he goes, we're not the super. We're just mid-supers. Go ahead and talk to the main super. So I sat there. I walked in. I go, can you sign this slip saying they didn't bring down the other nine units? Super looked across at me. He goes, what do you mean they didn't bring down the units? I said, I came here. 20 minutes ago, asked your guy, the guy was on the walkie-talkie, didn't bring him down. 
He goes, let me see this sheet. He gets, looks at the guy beside him. He goes, tell that, tell the crane operator to bring the toilets down or both of you guys are looking for a job tomorrow. <laughs> Those toilets are down about 10 minutes. <laughs> Why? What was he doing? He, was just, he was just, he wanted to do something else. He didn't think the toilets were a priority. But the problem is at the end of the day, the workers aren't safe if the toilets aren't clean. And we only, let's say on that site, we're going maybe twice a week, but that was, let's say on a third, on a Wednesday afternoon. So they were going, Otherwise, the next two days, it wouldn't be service. So then it wouldn't be service till Monday morning after that. So they'd be on a whole week without service. What is the general vibe, Roger? Like, I mean, with, with all the sites that you go and visit, are, are, we, are we a happy bunch these days or what's going on? Well, I think the sad part is, is that a lot of people used to build the houses that I see for the families. So let's say you're doing a custom home. You're building it for the family. You've seen the kids, the young kids. They're going through it. Okay, this is Joey's bedroom. This is Jesse's bathroom. This is everything's being built. And now, let's say it takes a year to build. At seven months, eight months, the people are showing up with real estate agents going, how much do you think I can sell this for? So let's say person sits there and says, okay, we're building it for a million bucks. And now, before you even got it done, they've got a for sale sign on there. And now they're going to sell it for $1.5, $1.7 million dollars. And you're sitting there going, my cost is kind of locked in. And I thought I was building it. I was putting out a little extra effort in to make sure Joey's bedroom was the best and yeah. little Jessica's bedroom yeah. was all good. And wait a second, this person doesn't even care about it. It's all a fraud. They want to basically sell the house for as much profit as possible. So it kind of takes the heart of the construction person because they used to sit there and say, okay, we're building that for that family. They signed the contract and everything's good, but now – people are selling everything. And I mean, I don't blame them. I mean, some of these places are selling for twice the amount that it's, 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 it's cost. It's not take advantage of the market, take advantage of the market, but it kind of sometimes sucks because your costs are sometimes fixed. And some of these construction get people are losing money because they've signed a contract They're ethical people. They said they're going to build it for 1 million. They're going to make a, a few points on it. Now they're making just a hair or just a little bit below water, but they're an ethical company. They want to stay, they want it. They don't want their name to go down, so they stay at that price. And then the person sells it for makes five hundred thousand dollars on the sale, and they've done zippo work on it. And that's what ticks off a lot of people. I can see in the you see a lot of tradespeople like they it stops them from giving their heart and soul and taking that extra little bit of effort yeah. to build things properly. Uh, they don't care anymore. They don't care because everybody's making this much more money. The person, the real estate agents, flipping the money. But the, the tradesperson's not. The tradesperson's and not. The suppliers and distributors and everybody else that's attached to them, they're not. They're not making the money. And in, in the GCs, everybody's set at the cost. Like I mean, there's two. They're, they've been building some of these buildings for two to three years. That should have taken a year and a half to build. And it's sad because they've been slowed down because. It, and then the problem is the trade goes in there, and a lot of the trades now. Let's say the big GC gets it. And then they sub it to somebody else, and then they sub it, and then they sub it. Everybody so takes their points. Everybody takes their points. So the person that's working on there could be six people, six six separations away, and they've never worked on a big site like that before. So their health and safety is not up to code. They're not ready for this stuff. They're not. So they go up there and they're painting walls or doing drywall. So then the proper company comes in to finish it up. It's a big mess because the walls aren't straight. The, everything like the, the, everything's not right. So then it, the problem is the person says, well, who did the drywall? This company did the drywall. How am I supposed to paint that? I can't paint that. And it's like, or you're supposed to have three free electrical sockets in that wall. Yeah. <laughs> and the person's like, yeah, well, what are we supposed to do? Well, the code it says there has to be three electrical sockets in that wall. We got to rip that wall apart. We can't. Well, how are we gonna how are we gonna run this room that we're in right now if you got no electrical? This is after they've been passed. Yeah, like I mean, or people are looking. I mean, but people walk in. The person that's buying the house or buying or buying the GC that's looking at the rooms. Let's say you've set this room up, and they're looking at it going, well, the electrical hasn't been done in this room. Why is the drywall up? Oh, the guy just did the drywall on the weekend, but he can't do the drywall because we haven't done all the other stuff. We haven't even insulated. The guy put the drywall up. So how do we get these tradespeople to love the business again, even though that people, homeowners and users are going to just basically take advantage of the situation? I think sometimes we need to slow down a little bit. I agree with you. We're we building to, too fast. We're building too fast. Life's going too fast right now. We just got to sometimes sm stop and smell the roses, go fishing on weekends, 
just chill out for a little bit, not work 60, 80 hours a week. Sometimes we don't because at the end of the day, they can replace us at any time. But we're being pressured. It's if you don't finish this one, buy this one. I'm not going to get you more work on the next one. I'm not going to do this. And now you're losing out. Now your security's gone. But now the sad part is, is that the good contractors, the good general contractors, the good sub trades are basically telling the GCs, yeah, do whatever you want. Okay, fine. Does it, does, you don't want us? Hire, hire Joe Blow and he'll do that job for you at $300,000. i am quoting 500000 But when I come back in to fix Joe's problems, I'm going to be now at 600000 You paid Joe 300000 Now you get $900,000 on the thing. person's like, what do you mean? I got to fix all Joe's mistakes. So you sit there at the start, pay me five hundred. Yes, it's a lot of money. But at the end of the day, I have the crew. I can get it done. It's going to be done, right? Where if you want to hire some smuck at the start, you're going to be all wrecked. And the site's going to be in problems, and then you're not going to get delays, and then your quality of work isn't going to be done at the end. I agree with you. I totally agree with you. But people don't understand that. And then the problem is too many people don't take enough time for themselves. They don't take enough time for family, and they don't take enough time for actual f- fun stuff. I mean, they don't go, f- like, every Saturday and Sunday in the summer, I go fishing with my dad. We go, he's got a pon- we got a pontoon boat at the cottage. We go out, we catch big pike, we catch bass, and we sit there for two hours. We go to every morning at 8 o'clock, we take our dog with Golden Retriever, and we just sit there, we don't talk about work, we just talk about life. Just because he, he's 84 years old, and I figure you just got to have fun. How old is the dog? Dog's 10. 10 years old? 10-year-old Golden Retriever. He just loves it, he just sits there, and we catch a big pike, and he just looks at them like, like sometimes he used to be more agile and like, bark at them but now he's kind of like okay i'll just kind of move out of the way (laughs) but it's all about having fun but the thing is is that too many people expect they have time but we don't know how much time we have left so people gotta enjoy themselves like you gotta go snowmobile and you gotta go ice fishing you gotta you gotta spend time take advantage people say you gotta spend time with your family yes you gotta spend time with your family but you also gotta do stuff for yourself because they say if the lion ain't happy then the lions the lions gotta feed the whole pride yeah and if the lion sits there and is stressed and everybody else and he's that person's not doing enough and they think it's doing too much and all of a sudden that lion goes down, the whole pride goes down. Where sometimes the lion's got to sit there and spend some time for himself. Did you ever think that you were going to take over for your dad? Is that what was in the plan? Well, I'm the only child we know of in our industry for my parents. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we don't, so that's what I always say. But my dad always said, he goes, whatever you want to do, you do. But he forced me, he shouldn't say forced me, but he wanted me to go to university. I got an economics degree from Gretchen University up in Sudbury. And his basic philosophy was, like, I worked. Like, when I was nine years old, I was working, cleaning toilets in the yard. Ten, ten, like, 12, 14, I was backing trailers up in the yard. 16, got my driver's license. 16, two months, I was delivering toilets. Like, but you can't do that anymore with insurance. Now you got to be 25 to yeah. get on the insurance. So it really takes out... A lot of people that are that could be doing our, our industry. Then uh, it was then I got back from university and my dad said he goes, What do you want to do? And I said, I want to work here. He said, Okay, now you're vice president. And he said he goes, but he goes, if you ever want to go, no problem. He goes, I never want you to sit there and say you were forced to work here. Because I goes, I always wanted you to have opportunities because I always, that's my kids are 14 and 16. I have a son that's 16, a daughter is 14. And my philosophy is the same thing. I want them to be happy because that's the way I've always grown up. That's the way I run my, my business and that's the way I run my life with John Lennon. They asked me, he's five years old, what do you want to be in life? I said, I want to be happy. I remember that interview. And he goes, I just want to be happy. And people don't realize it. It's like, I don't need to be rich. I want to be happy. I want to have enough money. But at the end of the day, I want to go to sleep every night. I don't want to be, have worries. I don't want to be sitting there going, oh, I should have done this. I should have done that. My, my philosophy is I hit the bed. My wife hates it, but I hit my head. It's a pill. I go to sleep. Pass it up. And that's, that's the way I want it. Do you love what you do, Roger? I love what I do. You love what you do? Yeah, it keeps me happy. I walk to work. We're on 50 acres. We have their operation. I, my parents' house is on the same property. with six and a half acres on commercial. My house is on the top of the hill. So I walk down to work every day. It's a great feeling. Very, very environmentally friendly. I try to be as, like, it's nice sometimes living on the property because my wife hates it sometimes because I can go to, on Sunday afternoon, I'll walk down and do a couple hours worth of work because everything's quiet. But, but it's the best feeling. It's the best. Family industries are the best because that's where you get the reward from. Is that the model of the business that, that you've grown since your dad left that 
Oh, he hasn't left. He's still, he's talked to me four times today. Oh, so really? Yeah. Huh? Oh yeah. He's always involved. Like he's, he's 84 years old and he loves the business. Like he, like, he'll come back next week and he'll put his uniform on and he'll come down to the shop and he'll, he'll be, and my mom will, mom will come down to the office and they all work. Good I mean, for them. my people say, well, aren't your parents ever going to retire? I said, I go, is it retirement about doing what you want? Yeah. And that's what they do. They go down to Florida. They went down in Thanksgiving. They were down in Thanksgiving and they come back up. And then they're going back up for about seven days because of uh, for Christmas. Because last year they were down in Florida and they didn't come back up. And my kids were kind of a little bit sad that they didn't see grandma and grandpa at Christmas. Yeah. So, and then this year, my my daughter, she lost her eyesight due to diabetic because oh. she's a diabetic and yeah. got um, cataracts in both eyes. But thanks to sick kids, they did the surgery and now she's got full eyesight back. Wow. And we found out she's a type 1 diabetic and now she's gained weight back and she's healthy and I got to give a shout out to sick kids. They did amazing work. They were professionals. We just had the last surgery a week and a half ago. Good. So, I mean, once they figured out, it's like they were amazing. They're best best hospital in the world. So you just look at, I mean, because you know that everybody looks at your industry as an industry that we wouldn't want to be a part of, but you have such a positive outlook on this industry. Well, the way I look at it is, like, people sit there and say, well, you're in a portable toilet business. Like, how do you do that? And I'm like... As I sit there and I look at every truck, every every time my uh, truck drops up sewage off of the sewage plant, that's money to me. It's like every time we rent toilets, it's like, and we also were concerned about service. If we got a service complaint, we're trying to figure out what the problem is. We're trying to figure out like what the, like we're saying, how many people are on site, what's the problem? Is it is it blocked in by vehicles? Is it in a bad location? Do you have too many people on one site? Let's say you have a a building where there's a unit on each side. Well. Maybe we need to have two units on that one side and no units on the other side because everybody walks to there because why? Because that's where all their vehicles are. You're one of the few uh, suppliers that ask all these questions about the site to try to get an idea of how it should be actually oriented, right? Well, we actually interview our, our, our people that are sites because some people call us up and like, we want you to come on site. So our first question is, who do you got on site now? Why aren't you happy? Oh, they don't service the toilets. They don't do this. Well, how many workers you got? I got 50 workers. How many toilets you got on site? Three. That's how why. many times you got service? Once a week. Yeah, but sometimes they don't always come. Or sometimes the person's arguing at us, yelling at us because we've got vehicles blocking the way. And, and I'm like, well, first of all, you need more units. Second of all, you need the toilets have to be accessible. And third... We can set up a time, like make it work for you. Well, on the third, sites. you let everybody know what your day of the week is that it actually comes for servicing. Yeah. And you kind of are on a schedule. So then you know that you're a morning or an afternoon visit. Yeah. Prepare for it. Yeah. And that's what we try to say. Like, I mean, it's not as easy now as it used to be because of traffic. I mean, traffic's getting harder. Everything's like, it's, everything's not the same, but um, we try to, we try to stay with the same schedules and everything like that. But we interview our construction companies. So we've actually probably in the last two years probably turned down probably half the work. Because they didn't meet the cut? Well, the problem is, is that their expectations sometimes, as we say, we want customers who want to pay. We cut, try to cut out the two percenters. Yeah. We try to cut out the bad companies. We try to cut out the people that don't care about their workers. We got people sit there and say, I don't want a flush toilet. I don't want to, I don't want heat. I don't want a hand sanitizer. I just want the basic bare bones thing. And it's basically like, okay, I guess we can't service you. And the person's like, no, I want the cheapest unit. You got to supply it. Well, do you want to meet, do you want to have workers on site that are health, that are safe? And you want to have ministry of labor offer? I don't care about the ministry of labor. I don't care about my workers. You will. And that's basically when we sit there and say, I'm sorry, person, we can't help you. And the person's like, well, that's no way to run a business. It's like, well, we got 25 trucks on the road. We got a very successful company. Everything's paid for. And we've been doing it for the last 58 years. And that's our business model. And it works for us they might have to reevaluate their business because the pro well, I didn't, I didn't justify this cost in my job. Well, maybe that's why you're not going to be in business in the next two, in the next year, because you didn't push, put the prices in. We got lots of customers that call us up. We're doing a big condo. We're doing this. Can you put prices in? We need the prices solved. We know that they're going to go up a little bit, but we want to make sure prices like what we're doing with. And that's, everything's a cost. I mean, that's why, Nobody has a problem. Too many people sit there and say, oh, yeah, toilets, don't worry about it. But at the end of the day, it's a necessity. Yep. And when you don't budget for it, like some people do sewer and water work, they don't budget that they need a toilet because it's there for two months or a month. 
They haven't budgeted that. Well, I haven't budgeted that. I just budgeted $5,000 for the job. Because they took the template before and what was always allocated, yep. and that's not what it was allocated for. And everybody else bid $8,000, $9,000 yeah. because they had proper first aid for stations. They had proper this. They had proper wash down facilities. They had everything. Why? Because it costs a little bit more money to do it right. And at the end of the day, everybody goes home at night. I mean, all you custom resi guys and girls out there that are doing the work, asking for 350 bucks for a proper toilet per month for, you know, four site visits, cleaning and maintenance, that's not a lot of money in the scope of work when you are doing a $100,000 job or whatever. Even if you're doing a $50,000 job, it's not a lot of money. Well, the thing is, is that we have to take the toilet there. We have to deliver it. Yeah. Then we have to do it for service and we have to pick it up. I mean, yeah. it costs money. It does. And it's not like there's massive margins on these things, but this is like something that everybody that's in this industry should be budgeting correctly for it. And then if you can, for whatever reason, try to upgrade it so then you can get a slightly larger unit. Trust me, your tradespeople, your subcontractors, they're all going to really respect you for that. They're going to appreciate the extra effort for that little thing that happens to all of us two, three times, four times, whatever, a day that, you know, you go out there and you have to use the facilities. Like I was on one of the big jobs, one of the sewer job, uh, big subway jobs. They were working on that about six years, about eight years ago. And I was down there and the super goes, he goes, I want to meet with you, but cost. So I said, okay. So I went down there with my office manager. We went down there, met in the trailer. And I said, I go, he goes, the trades people love your toilets. He goes, we love you because you get the servicing done. You do everything we want. The Ministry of Labor loves you because they got exactly what you want. <laughs> so I said, what's your problem? He goes, cost. And I said, I go, so I said, I go, we're doing four things that you had your matrix of that you wanted done right. Yes. So we're meeting all those stuff, right? Yes. So I think technically we should be increasing your cost. Yes. And the person's like, and I said, I go, look how much your driver, look how much your laborers are making here. $60 per hour. I go, how much is costing? I said, I go, 10 hours or 600 bucks for one person. How many people are on site? 60 people. That's a lot of money. So if you figure if we could save one hour a day for your people, we're making you guys up a lot of money. And sure. it's, and it's, and the accounting guy's looking at me going, he's right. But the problem is everybody tries to then pick on the little things where they got to look at the big things. I mean, I don't know how people are supposed to save money right now when cost of lumber, cost of fuel, cost of everything keeps going up and up and up. And then supply shortages, windows, doors. But in all fairness, all those costs are going up and up and up for you as well, too. Oh, yes. Like, cost of fuel has gone up. Like, everything's going up. Like, cost of vehicles, one of the, we look at their new trucks, are $17,000 more more expensive. Wow. So we're just kind of like him and Han, whether we get we're two or three more trucks, but $17,000 is a big hit. <laughs> That's a huge hit. Let me do a little green book talk here, talking about the ministry. Uh, facility fines. Uh, you're probably familiar with these ones or aware of them, not that you're familiar with them. Uh, facilities uh, means toilet, urinal, and cleanup facilities. If the constructor does not provide or arrange the four facilities for workers before the work has started at a project, the fine is how much? Take a guess. $200. 550 550 550 is a fine from the Ministry of Labor. If the constructor does not ensure that the facilities are located less than 180 horizontal meters from the work area tunnel uh, entrance, that's the minimum. Three kilometers from the work area is transportation is if transportation is provided, or nine vertical meters for the level uh, from the level being worked on. Uh, the fine, if you if you don't meet those criteria, it's 550 bucks. Right, but I don't think too many people are getting fines. I think more of it's... Warnings. Warnings. Yeah. But they get... But the thing is, people don't realize if we also get... The, the portable toilet company also gets also gets written up if we don't have the proper units on site. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, we get written up. If Let's say if we don't have, let's say, let's say somebody's with a construction toilet right now, somebody says, well, why isn't their heat involved? Why isn't their heat in that toilet? You'll still get written up. We'll get written up. Why would you get written up? Because we're supposed to know that we're supposed to tell them that they're supposed to have a heater warm water. Well, what if you tell the GC that or the site well, super? Well, they sign it on their contracts at the bottom. It says that you require heater warm water and heat in your units. But that's not your fault if they don't want to pay well, that's you. Why we have, that's why we have it at the bottom of our yeah. contract in big writing saying that. And we also tell the people that if you have electricity on site, that this is what you require. But the Ministry of Labor will still give you a warning too. They'll, they'll actually write us up. Really? They'll write us up. 
Uh, We've had supers. I remember one time I had a, a, a Ministry of Labor guy phoned me up just after five, and I was just about to walk out of the office, and I phoned up, and I'm like, he phones me up, he starts yelling at me, how come you guys rented these toilets that aren't meeting regulations? And I sat there, and I'm like, I got a question for you, sir. He's like, what? I go, you driving a Hummer? And he goes, no. I said, why isn't the Ministry of Labor supplying you with a Hummer? He goes, they don't have the money. And I sat there, and I'm like, well, Hummer, I said, if you're in an accident, I said, you don't get hurt. They have self-regulating tires, I said, so they're always inflated. They're all-wheel drive. They're a big unit. I said, you don't get, you can carry all kinds of stuff. I said, it's a nice, it's a nice safe unit, truck. Well, that's, we're not talking about the same thing. So I said, I go, you're trying to tell me that every super out there is not trying to bend the rules a little bit. Of course they are. And I said, I go, I go, now you're yelling at me because I supplied a toilet that I've already told the person he's supposed to have a heated warm water and a heater in it. But they sat there and they told me there's no electricity on site. Well, they're lying to you. I go, I'm not on the site. So what am I supposed to say that I'm going to call a, a super liar and now he's going to, and he's going to go somewhere else. So I can't do that. So after about five minutes of being back and forth with the soup, with the Ministry of Labor inspector, we got a good respect for each other. So I said, I go, at the end of the day, we all want to come home safe, right? Yes. And I say, I said, I go, is your vehicle, is it, goes your vehicle four-wheel drive, all-wheel drive? No. You got snow tires on? Not yet. I said, I go, so you're bitching and complaining about us, not surprising. I, I said, why isn't your supplier? I go, why aren't you yeah. complaining about this? There's a bunch of things. It's like... Well, I, 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 it's like you got, as I tell my dad said, you stand up when you're right, you, you fight. If you're wrong, you admit you're wrong and you walk away. But if you're right, you, walk, you respect yourself and you fight. Do you think, Roger, if a Ministry of Labor agent inspector was on site and they were inspecting the toilet and they opened it and the toilet's been disrespected by some tradesperson on the site, would they be more inclined to actually issue a fine instead of a warning? It depends. I mean, they can look at it. if it's just fresh, like just somebody went in there and made a mess. Yeah. They can sit there and say, okay, this has been just happening this day. They're going to go in and tell the super, okay, you need to get the service, call Winters, you need to get them in here. Or they sit there and they say, well, they walk in and all of a sudden it's like they look at the site and it's like toilet hasn't been serviced. There's debris everywhere. There's garbage everywhere. There's rusty nails. There's boards sticking up. They're going to look at the go. Nobody can safely walk to that toilet. No yeah. wonder why the service driver didn't service it because your site's a complete disaster. You got to get hepatitis. You got to get tetanus walking to that toilet. Yeah. So that's why a lot of these sites, this Ministry of Labor is good, but we've noticed in the past year, Ministry of Labor enforcement's gone down to nothing. Like two years ago, like when COVID first came out, we we're getting calls all the time. Now the Ministry of Labor inspectors, maybe one or two calls this year. Nothing. They're just turning a blind eye? They're turning a blind eye. I don't know what... It's sad for the construction industry because there's nothing... They're not doing anything for anybody. You ever seen a Ministry of Labor inspector use a toilet on site? I don't know. I've never seen one use a toilet on site. I've seen them inspect it, look yeah. at it. Um, just that, to, just to That's what we always tell the Ministry of Labor inspectors. Open a door. Look inside. Yeah, I mean, our, peek inside. our units have a electrical cord on the outside. We put a sticker on the front that says, warm, warm wash inside. And that way, they can just tell right out the front of the units. It's a heat of warm water sink. The ministry, the workers, contractor's done what he's supposed to do. That's part of their inspection when they're on a job site. That's part of their inspection. But I think right now is they're only doing reactive. They're not doing proactive. Yeah, but it goes back to your point and earlier in the show where we were talking about that. If you have a clean facility and a maintained facility, you have a better workforce. But the sad part is, is that some of these people, some of these supers, the workers aren't showing up. Nobody's showing up for the job, and some of these people don't have a good respect for anybody. They're just they're just frustrated with everything, so they don't care. That's a whole other show. That's, that's, a, whole that's, <laughs> that's a whole other. But what I'm just saying is, at the end of the day, people got to be happy. I mean, you got to have a happy workforce. You got to do stuff. Of that, so I'm just trying to think of as many little things that you can do, including getting the right toilet and taking care of it, making everybody happy. It's make the best thing to do is I always we used to have one service driver. He was. Not the fastest, but at the end of the day, he did more toilets than anybody else. But if you watched him, he was slow and consistent. He Every time he walked to his truck to the toilet, he did two things. Every time he walked to the truck, back and forth, he did two things. Where some people, I don't know, as I sit there and say, some people get out of the truck, they walk to the toilet. I don't know if they're expecting to see a, a, 
a shamrock or a, or a four leaf clover or or a million dollars of cash sitting there. But <laughs> as I always say, take something to the toilet, take the hose, take the water, start filling your sink, start cleaning it. But take something. Don't sit there and walk to the toilet and then come back. It's like I don't know. As my uncle used to say, if you put one of those things that for how many steps he did, he'd probably be maybe 500 steps. And people are like, don't you walk 500 steps? But those 500 steps counted. Somebody else might have done 5,000 steps yeah. because he was smart. Every step, he was very... Every step of the way. Every step is a good <laughs> thing. He didn't walk five. He goes, goes, why would I waste my time? He got, and I, one time when I was young, he goes, I hate work. And I sat there and I go, oh, girl, you hate work? He goes, I hate doing it twice. I want to do it once. He goes, I want to do it once. I want to do it right. He goes, I hate work. And I'm like, I was kind of like offended. I'm like, what do you mean you hate work? But he hates doing it twice. Like, do it once, do it right. Stop, stop wasting my time. Roger, we got the 12 questions left. Um, uh, I want to let everybody know, KW Winter Sanitation, Inc., uh, www.winsan.on.ca, uh, winsan at winsan.on.ca, and K Winter's Toilets on IG and also Facebook. Uh, we actually came across some names, nicknames uh, for toilets, which are Lou, Ken, John, Johnny, Bogger, Brasco from Australia, Throne, Latrine, Crapper, uh, and WC, Water Closet. What other kinds of nicknames you guys have? Well, my dad always says, no splinters, use winters. <laughs> <laughs> and then we no also used to have, we service bums, we'll service you too. <laughs> <laughs> they used to be on the bottom of our business card. And we used to have quality is like buying oats. Sometimes oats cost a fair price. And sometimes if you don't mind paying a little less, you can get it for coming out of the horse's butt. <laughs> <laughs> it all depends what type of quality you want. What type of, that's the we. That's the way we look at it. If you want good quality, you got to pay a fair price. If you want junk, then you can get it at the back and get shit. So, How is the industry between you guys and competition? Everybody else, is it pretty cutthroat or you guys are? Well, the worst part right now, everybody's getting bought out. Everybody's getting bought out. Like everybody's getting, like people are selling. Really? Like, well, some big corporations are coming big in. Big corporations are coming in because right now with the Canadian dollar being so low, it's very incentivized to buy companies. Wow. So probably... Half, probably a third of the companies in Toronto area have been bought out. Are you guys next or no? No, you're, we're a family, family company. There's no, family. It's, it's like people come to me and say, we'll buy you out. I go, okay, I'm 48 years old. I have a 16 to 14 year old kids. My family, I live in the same property. I love it. What am I going to do? So I retire. I can only do so much. Yeah. I like, I like living. I like doing i like help you love what you're doing i love what i'm doing i like doing that i don't want to stop like why would i stop but my dad says sometime there might be a time when you want to sell and that's a different time right now we don't want to sell but time could come when my kids don't want it or whoever doesn't or maybe it's just the industry's done and we're done but right now we're just thriving we're just enjoying it it's happy you're We're just enjoying it. We want, we want to go back to John Lennon philosophy. We want to be happy. Ready for the 12 questions? Yep. What is your favorite construction word? Get her done. What's your least favorite construction Delays. word? Delays. What turns you on in construction? Building things. What turns you off in construction? Customers who don't pay. What is your favorite? That happens to you guys too? Yeah. How does that work when you guys are? What we do is we take it back to them. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. We just tell people just get a tank ready because we're gonna technically you haven't paid for your shit, so we're gonna bring it back to you. I don't you'd know if I want to piss you guys off, man. You'd be surprised how many customers are like you're funny. <laughs> it's like my dad's like I'm not joking. <laughs> <laughs> Watch, we'll bring it back. Uh, what's your favorite curse word? Get your shit tents ready. <laughs> what's your favorite vehicle in the world? Jeep Rubicon. What's your least favorite vehicle? Hyundai Pony. Oh, man, I know. That one's been mentioned a few times. What construction sound noise do you love? Bulldozers. What construction sound noise do you hate? Silence. Nothing's working on sites. That's what I hate. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt one day? Massage therapist at the Playboy Mansion. <laughs> Doesn't exist anymore, eh? I know, but I could create it. <laughs> You're saying. <laughs> what profession would you not like to do? Work at a slaughterhouse. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at those pearly gates? What a ride. Roger, man. Absolute pleasure having you on the show, man, and sharing these stories, man. Any other little 
interesting situations that you've gotten into? Well, I always look at it that we, we've had, as I tell people, that we solve problems. Like when we did the Union Station job, the person wanted different things. We sat there and we built it for them. People, like, as the guy said, they asked us to jump. People say, how high? I asked the person, when do you want us to land? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Roger, thank you so much, everybody. Again, K.Winter Sanitation, Inc., and it's www.winson.on.ca, winson at winson.on.ca, and K. Winters Toilets on Instagram and Facebook. Thank you, man. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. It was a great time Cheers. here. All right. Thank you, Angelina. We're out of here.